thank you so much, brother. Once again, you delivered as, as I'd expect, as we'd expect, uh, exegetical, theological, pastoral, applied to our lives. Thank you so much for your labors. Um, one of my ambitions for our panels is to get through some of the transition to elders. How do you transition to elders questions? So I'm going to back it up a step or two before your talk and then move into your talk if that's all right. A question for you guys, just kind of real quick answers. If you're candidating at a church and it does not have a plurality of elders, do you tell them you want to go in that direction while a candidate? They're not there. They're not thinking about it. Do you tell them? I would. You all would, I assume? Anybody not? I, I would, but I'd be wise without being deceptive in how I tell them. I wouldn't just come out and say, now you need to understand, I'm here six months and we'll be uh, at plurality of elders. Uh, you just might as well go on back home because they ain't going to call you. Uh, and you were kind of, I think, unwise in the way you shared it. What you, I would do is say, I have a very strong biblical conviction that this is what the New Testament teaches about church government. I'm a thoroughgoing, con a lot of people here, plurality of elders, they think elder rule, not elder led. And I think you've got to be very clear that you, are, you affirm congregationalism, uh, that you see yourself as a servant to the congregation, but you see the wisdom of the New Testament's teaching in a plurality of leaders that all meet the biblical qualifications of 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, 1 Peter 5, and you, you teach them. And, you know, Mark said he led Capitol Hill to move from a single pastor to plurality of elders, but it took several years, four years. How that's my next question. How long do you teach? Uh, however long it takes. Yes. When do you know it's time to push for that change? Or when do you know it's too soon? 60% of the congregation seems to oppose me. Is now the time? When, when, when's the time? I think when people start asking you, when are we going to do what the Bible says? So I, I think to, to Danny's point, no, I'm serious. I, th I think to Danny's point. That happened to um, you once. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I, I think that's HB's experience as well. Uh, I think um, when you're having that conversation about what your convictions are, do that with your Bible open. If, so if they got an argument, let them be arguing with the Bible about what the Bible actually means, not with you because you're using words like congregationalism and da 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 and none of the people know what you're talking about. And so they, you know, it gets associated with you. This is your idea that you're coming in with. And then that gets pitted against their tradition and their sense of identity in a really unhelpful way. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I think at some point if you're candidating, you're probably standing up before the congregation and people are asking you questions and getting to know you. Open your Bible. Go to 1 Timothy 3. Go to those passages on elders and say, hey, and be humble and say, Actually, part of why I think we need to do this is because I think God has gifted many of you and he intends you to help with the leading of the church and I can't do this by myself. And so if I come, I'm going to want to help, want, want to have some help. And, and I think this is what the Bible is teaching and, and lead people through that. And, and at some point, if you're teaching it well, over four years, five years, however the case may be, people start to come to you and say, you be talking about this all the time. When are we going to do it? And that, that's a clue. What wisdom do you guys have if I'm looking at the conger, I'm the senior pastor or the solo pastor, I'm looking at the congregation, I'm thinking, I just don't think there's any other qualified men here. What now? Well, then you don't call any to be elders since they're not qualified <laughs> and you do the work, but part of the work is for you to raise up men that will meet those qualifications and sense that calling. And that may take two years, four years, five years, seven years. Uh, you know, if you're there for the long, let me say this, there may be, from a sitting from where I sit at the seminary. If you go into a situation and you have no intention but staying there for a few years, you forfeit the right to do a lot of things. You absolutely do not have the right to basically tear that church asunder and then you walk away and leave bodies strewn everywhere. That's irresponsible. That's ministerial malpractice. But if you're going to be there for the long haul, again, one of my heroes, Adrian Rogers, said when he was asked one time, why didn't you make that change immediately? And he said, when you're going to be at a place for 20 or 25 years, you don't have to make every change the first year. And he said, I can make changes without virtually dismembering the body. And because I don't want to do that to the body unless it's absolutely essential, I can move more slowly with certain, especially when it's not a matter of orthodoxy 
uh, or the gospel, something, you know, that's core with respect to the uh, beliefs and the, the convictions of the church and scripture, then you can move slower in some areas because you realize my goal is long-term, not short-term. And I think that impacts how you pastor. My impression, however, also is that guys can have too high of standards, though, for what an elder is. Jeremy, agree or disagree? Yeah, I, I, that's, that's what I was going to say, too. I think sometimes when guys say I have no elder qualified guys, I want to step back and say, well, what's an elder qualified person? And sometimes the standard is so high uh, that, that, that everyone's scared away. But it's like, no, you actually do have some elder qualified guys. You just need to start with the people God's given you and raise them up uh, over time and, and build them up and strengthen them. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I, I, when Paul writes to Titus in Crete and describes Crete the way he describes Crete, after having said in verse 5, the reason I left you there was to appoint elders in every town, he seems to me to be assuming that, that that's A, Titus's job to, to, to train and invest in guys, but he seems to be assuming B, that even in Crete, there are going to be some folks who are, who are elder qualified in that context. Now, they may not be elders in Ephesus, right? Uh, but in Crete, they may be perfectly godly people uh, to, serve, to serve the ministry. Um, so, to me, you're saying it's okay for there to be relative standards. Well, I think how we understand um, the sort of qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 and, and, and Titus 1, um, yeah, it's going to, it's, there's going to be some contextual variance. So it. one brother might appear apt to preach or teach in this setting, That's right. and yet not really in this setting over here. That's right. But he genuinely is in this setting compared to what else there is. And here, there are just others who could serve better, so it wouldn't be best he served that way here. And a church in this setting or that setting would honor the elder from that church to come in. Uh, in our context, we vow submission to our brothers in the Lord. And that means that I'm vowing to uh, submit to both teaching elders and ruling elders. And um, so, while well, the context I think differ, I think it is significant that you would, you would receive uh, an elder from a different context uh, because they, they do still have the same biblical qualifications. So. so we sometimes have Presbyterians preach in our pulpit on Sundays <laughs> at church. And I, I can take the Lord's Supper at your church because I was baptized as a believer in a horse trough. Well, at least it was a horse trough. Yeah. Excellent. And I went all the way under. Excellent. <laughs> all right, Danny, we don't have to have that conversation later. Like, we're we not, don't. We're, we're not going to take that turn. We're good. Yeah, this still says moderator. Let's not go there. Um, as I'm thinking about qualified Ben, kind of moving into your talk now a little bit more, should I peel my eyes especially, or should we peel our eyes especially for people who run the gamut of socio-demographic categories, ethnically, uh, education levels, uh, wealth levels, and so forth? Is that something we should be deliberate in looking for, for who our elders are? Yes, I think so. And uh, not in the sense of, okay, we have a so, sort of like we have to have this many people from this many demographic or whatever it is, but forcing ourselves to think that way. Uh, so, so I think like the qualification issue sometimes, say someone's not qualified, I wonder if there's sort of an operating uh, uh, perspective that, that qualified means someone who'd be qualified to be a leader in a white middle class business sense, right? And it's like, okay, but that, that's how leadership in that context would look, but what about in the church? So I think you have to kind of just sort of force yourself outside of your, your contextual lenses and to think about qualified people who are qualified in their context. That's why I think it can be so helpful to simply look in your congregation and especially look at people who don't look like yourself and see nodes of ministry. Whose house is open? Who's, whose dinner table is often full with others? Who do the members of the congregation turn to when they have a question? Mm -hmm. You know, who is giving out books? 
You know, who is having people around to study God's word? You know, who always has a story of somebody they were talking to about the gospel? That's, you just want to have an eye to those things. And you especially, you're naturally going to notice those things in people who are closer to you. So you have to deliberately think, okay, what are communities in my local church that I, I just naturally, I don't talk to as much or they don't talk to me as much. So how can I try to figure out what the Lord is doing there? Because I'm going to assume he's doing something there, you know. I just want to underscore the point you're making about for that to be, I think that's absolutely right. And I just want to underscore the point you're making is that for that sort of surveying for nodes of ministry to really be effective at this question of diversifying the leadership, the person doing the surveying, actually, you really must be in different circles in your congregation. And so sometimes I think guys are saying, well, I don't have anybody here. So actually, you don't know the people who don't look like you. Mm -hmm. When I went to my previous church, um, one of the first couples we had over for dinner, I've been in the church 20 years, godly, older, Jamaican couple. And uh, we're having dinner, and five minutes into the dinner, she had taken a bite of chicken. She put her, she pressed her fork and knife down beside the plate, and she leaned back, sat up straight, and she making an accent. She says, I can't take this anymore. And I'm looking at my wife like, what you do to the chicken, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like, it's like, two, you don't experiment when we have guests, right? You know, only experiment on the family. And so, and so I said, well, you know, what, what do you mean? And she says, um, I need to know why I'm here. So I've been in this church 20 years. I have never been in a pastor's home. And am I in trouble? And if so, just tell me right now. <laughs> she thought she'd been called to the principal's office. We were just trying to practice table fellowship. And these are two persons that I thought, you know, in a, in a short amount of time, I was like, these folks should be in leadership. You know, they're all over the place serving and caring for people and you know, he's the kind of Walter Cronkite in the congregation. And people trust his word and his report of things. And, um, and so it, it was, it, for me, it was an early indication of, okay, yeah, Thabiti, you need to make sure you're spending time with different people in the congregation in that way. And that's the way it was at Thabiti's church. <laughs> I, I, was, I was trying to... Nobody under 50 on the I know. It was an older person's <laughs> joke. Here we enjoyed it. I was trying to think of how Walter Cronkite in a Jamaican accent would sound. So... Just, Can you do it? 18 Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's funny, in, in our congregation, we've had a experience. A, a question we ordinarily ask of elder candidates is, does he spend time with a, a diversity of people? I think it is a good question. But we also learned recently, and this was, I, I think I can say this, in, in, in considering James, uh, somebody was asking the question, well, does he spend, he seems to spend a lot of time with, with the Asian Americans, um, especially the Korean Americans. But it was a situation where he had a highly developed ministry. We, we said node, different nodes of the church. Highly developed ministry to a group of people in the church that the rest of us weren't reaching into as much. And so in that situation, we were all encouraged by this brother's uh, very robust ministry to some people at the margins. Um, but it was instructive for us, I think, to think through these kinds of questions. My question for you, brother, is I think it's hard to see those invisible force fields, especially if you're inside of it. I was having a conversation with a brother a couple of weeks ago, and he's like, oh, there's an insiders group at CHBC, and he wasn't thinking ethnically or anything. He was just kind of the cool kids or something. I was like, I, I can't see it. What are you talking about? How can you help us see some of those force fields? Well, at first, at first I think just assume that in every church there's an inside group. It may not be malicious or even intentional, but you just may as well assume that in any group, including the church, there's going to be sort of inside and outside. And what you want to do, I think, is push the borders of inside out wider and wider, right? So you're including more. And then I think you want to think about, um, so answering the question, what kind of church are we? And spend some time thinking about that, not with your, your correct sort of biblical theological answers, but really, 
what, what kind of church are we? If, if people sort of walk in, what, what do they see? What do they hear? What am, what am I hearing from people who only visited once or, or, or were honest enough to give me their impression? How are people seeing us, right? How am I seeing us? And then I think you want to interrogate that, that vision, that perception of your church, um, particularly along the lines of sort of diverse categories, right? So just hypothetically. You, you ask yourself that question, what kind of church are we? And the answer kind of comes back, conservative. Well, conservative how? Well, theologically. Is that it? Well, no, we're also conservative socially. Anything else? Uh, politically. And you kind of ask yourself the question, when you, when you start to pile up those adjectives, then racialize it. Does that look white or black? or Hispanic or Asian. And when people not like our group, the, the predominant part of our group, sort of come into contact with those things, you're describing the force fields there. We're this conservative, theological, socially, political church. When they come into that, you know, what are the shibboleths? What are the tests, you know, questions that people have to pronounce correctly or answer correctly in order to kind of move through the force field? I mean, they, then you start to get a sense of what the, what the tests are and what the boundaries are at those tests. Um, and how other people are, are interacting that, with that and, and sensing that. And if you feel like that's too complex or abstract an exercise for you to do alone, and, and it probably is for all of us because it's in our blinders, that's all the more reason to grab some folks who don't look like you and say, honestly, tell me. What, what, are, you, what are you picking up? You know, what are you bumping into? What makes you uncomfortable? What makes you comfortable? Um, what makes you want to leave? Um, what kinds of things seem like requirements to you for being here? What kinds of things do you feel like are suggested to you, though the words are never used, that you must give up to be here? And then you're going to start to find out where the, where the boundaries are. I'm um, not sure you can do it without asking those questions. Well, I, I, and, and I'm encouraging both, yeah. but I'm encouraging the first because I actually think it's a discipline we have to learn uh, if we're going to be the body of Christ. And we're going to see any measurable progress uh, toward deeper unity in that way. So I think anybody just visiting us once is going to say we're a young, white, Republican church. You know, uh, They're not going to say any of those things 100%, but they're good. that's clearly what they're going to say, yep. just knowing where we are and who we are and what the church is like. So what do I do as a senior pastor when I'm, let's say I'm not some of those adjectives. Um, <laughs> Well, well, that could have been the one I was thinking about. Uh, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to particularly look for examples in my sermon, people to lead in the service, people to take roles of responsibility in teaching, in course seminars, uh, as an elder, who are not in one of those categories. I'm going to try to think of what are ways I can exaggerate our diversity in order to create more diversity. Not to do something that's politically correct, but to do something that brings the attention to Jesus. To have, in, in the book Jamie Dunlop and I wrote called Compelling Community, to have a gospel-revealing community rather than a gospel-concealing community. Because when we have gospel plus commonalities, oh yeah, we're all Christians and we're all fill in the blank. Well, then the world understands why we're all hanging out together because we all hang out together at the country club. You know, but, but when all of a sudden... We don't all have these other things in common. Well, that's not trying to be politically correct. That's trying to say, hey, we're trying to draw attention to the fact that Jesus is what we have in common. So as a senior pastor, I want to be the one to try to think of that. I hope others are too, but if no one else, I want to be the one to think of how can I, you know, lift up and, you know, press forward these other things as a picture of the church. That's spot on. And, and the reason why I'm encouraging that, that exercise in, in, in sort of interrogating the self is because I've had conversations with folks who have been around CHBC for years and were shocked when I said to them, it's a Republican church. Shocked. It's like, well, brother, okay, that means <laughs> you're not thinking very carefully. Well, they may be thinking about all saying. the ways we try to not be partisan. You know, fair that, enough. No, no, they were just shocked. <laughs> they did, they, it hadn't occurred to them. And I'm thinking, okay, and you're not talking to enough people not like you. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm not even saying that you know, to sort of be thought of as a Republican church is, is, is necessarily a problem. 
but we need to be self-aware. Well, right? I think that's a perfect illustration because I think what's going on in the background there is Mark works very hard at being nonpartisan. And the elders as a whole work hard at being nonpartisan. And that's sort of the official policy. But what I hear you saying is, even still, there is a vibe. Well, you ask where people work. Oh, right. heritage. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. There's still a vibe and a culture of assumptions that people feel when they aren't well, a part of that. And I just think it's true of every church. Right. Right. So without, I, I don't want you get, I don't want anybody to get me wrong. I'm not assigning good, bad value to it. I'm just simply saying there is an is there. And, and if we want to sort of embrace people who aren't a part of that is, then we've got to know what it is. And, and then we've got to sort of move in ways against it. Because what I like about what you're saying in terms of people up front, so on and so forth, what that does is give you a sense that, oh, this, is, this may have the general character of being fill in the blank, but it's permeable. I can move into it and out of it. I can see a place for me. So when we first visited Capitol Hill, uh, we'd been there maybe two or three Sundays, loving it, my wife and I, driving home, about a 45-minute drive home. And uh, I remember getting on the highway one day and my wife saying, could you ever see yourself preaching there? said, no, ain't no way, man. You seen them? They got on Brooks Brothers suits, man, and all of them had been to Princeton, and, and that was my response. What's, what's well, you got to learn how to dress, bro. <laughs> learn how to dress. And then y'all went the other way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Calling out suits, though. And, and, and you're preaching there on Sunday. That's right, that's right. <laughs> and so, and, and, and the difference between my perception and the, the years I tre treasure and still treasure at Capitol Hill, relationship I treasure at Capitol Hill, was precisely what Mark was saying here. And so he'll, he'll be embarrassed by this because he didn't like to be commended publicly. But, you know, Mark took an interest in me right away. He didn't know me from Adam. He asked me those usual questions. What do you do? Da, da, da. And I was working at a think tank at the time. He said, so you want to work in a think tank all your life? I said, no. He said, well, what do you want to do then? What do you want to do with your life? And I said, well, if the Lord gives me years and allows me, I'd love to serve in pastoral ministry. And he says, he looked at my wife, he says, can he teach? So I, so I panicked there. I was like, what, what's, he, what's he gonna say, you know? And she said, yeah. And he says, well, brother, you need to call the office and get on my, on my calendar and we need to start having lunch, you know, so we can read Burkhoff together. And, da -da. and, and he just started giving me his life. Um, and so I, I think you're a great model of, of doing precisely what I'm, I'm trying to commend that we all do in the leadership especially and, and as we model that and teach that to the congregation also that we sort of cross boundaries and, and go to the edges and bring people in from the margins. That, that's the habit of our life. Fair to say as I read in one article recently, you're not going to have a multi-ethnic multi church unless you have a multi-ethnic life. Fair statement? Yeah, I don't know how it could be otherwise. And that means our friend groups, who we're inviting to birthday parties, who we go on vacation with, maybe the blogs we read. I mean, that just kind of goes into every category in a way of our lives, I think. I mean, right? I don't know how else you would accomplish it. You can't learn about people unless you're spending time with them. Yeah. It's 9.10. I have so it's, many it's, other things. It's bedtime. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just if you, you just want to know, it's HB and I have been talking about this, and you agree, brother? It's bedtime. <laughs> um, I'm reading the vibe. I'm reading the vibe. Go ahead. No, no invisible force field there. What? Go ahead. I would like to say where we started, that these matters take pastoral wisdom and spiritual discernment. And they take, in some instances, if you are, you, it takes time. And I don't think that should freak us out. I feel like there are things you would, I, I would be, some stories that are very, very good stories that I would be nervous to say because it would give the wrong impression that it was my shrewd leadership or something that we did. In some instances, it, just, it was just providence 
the gospel working. And there were just things I could not bring up when I got there. And I was in a hurting church, and the church stuck in its ways about things. And our first kind of step toward diversity was just the oops on the part of the leadership fighting me. Um, but a oops on their part was providential. And God opened the door for me to hire a white brother who's now our executive pastor seven years later. Um, but I would just say it, all of the things I, I'm hearing, I totally agree with. But in each of our contexts, we need to be practicing wisdom and patience and trusting the, that beyond our strategy, whatever, God is working. Well, and the patience is so important because it's like you look how our kids are formed. They don't attend a seminar with us one weekend and all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're done. You know, the Lord gives us years where we keep doing the same things again and again. And then slowly but surely we have whatever influence we have on them. Which also yeah. commends a man who plants a flag and hangs around. Because it takes time to nurture a healthy church. I think it's beautiful to hear this. And I've just been thinking about what you were saying, HB. And I think there are a lot of people, a lot of churches, maybe even a lot of pastors, elders, deacons here this evening. And, and I wonder if, if what's going through a lot of people's minds is you don't know my context. You don't know my town. You don't know my church. You don't know our history. The things y'all are talking about are so far out. And, and there's, this, there's this beauty of, of patience and, and trusting the Lord through these times and praying. The Spirit can do mighty things, and we have to trust the Lord to build the church he says he'll build and break down unnecessary walls and build appropriate bridges, build some of the right fences. And, and, uh, but I tell you what, the Spirit does mighty wonders and we have to get on our knees and pray and 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 work and strive and and uh boy it's it's you think about where where the church is even today and um we have to trust the lord it's good to pray regularly about things so we have a prayer meeting on sunday nights every week we pray for the regular preaching of god's word uh, every week we pray for diversity. We pray that we would be a congregation that by the very fact of who we are and how we love an, a, one another, we give evidence to the gospel uh, that what we have is, in common is Jesus. So as a pastor, you have some authority in being able to decide what's prayed about publicly. So think carefully how you want to catechize the congregation in assaulting the throne of God in prayer and what things you want to teach them to regularly be praying about and, and do that. Well, friends, we gather tomorrow morning at 9. I don't think we have any other announcements. Look at me remembering. Uh, we'll see you at 9. Let me close us in prayer. Father, we know that since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us here together who know you as well as our congregations into his presence. And we do look forward to that day, Lord. We pray that you would bring us quickly in Christ's name. Amen.